everyone, and welcome to my complete behemoth guide. I consider the behemoth the most difficult monster in the game so far, so this guide is especially important for players who might be feeling too frustrated or even too anxious to fight him. I've organized the guide into three major sections. There's going to be a flowchart as well as a breakdown of the flowchart. Then we're going to move into 10 tips, five of them are, you know, I call them basic tips and then five more are more specific tips, They're, I'll call them advanced tips, right? And then after that, we're going to go into a very important section where we talk about a behemoth's moveset. So that'll, that'll be the three parts of the guide, flowchart, tips, moveset. Let's get started. The behemoth flowchart. Similar to Kulv Taroth, the behemoth is a longer fight that changes as he moves into different sections of the map. I start off with the section for pre-fight preparedness because I feel like that makes a big difference, especially when you're talking about uh, a more complicated fight, right? You want to be prepared. So here's a list of required items for you to bring into the fight. To your radial menu, you'll want to add the Final Fantasy emote probably the Astera Jerky for fast use, as well as Flash Pod Crafting. The Barrel Bombs are also pretty important for sleep bombing, and depending on your teammates, you might get more than one opportunity to sleep bomb, which is why you're bringing the materials needed to craft extra of those. So you might add that to your radial menu as well. Let's talk briefly about builds for the Behemoth. We'll do a little introduction. Most players agree that cluster bombing the Behemoth is the easiest strategy for fighting him. I have a whole guide on how to cluster bomb, which I'll leave a link to in the comment section below. Other than damage, there are going to be two other roles that players will want to think about. Someone who can easily grab and maintain the behemoth's aggro, which we will call enmity from now on, as well as a dedicated wide range healer. That one's really important. Let me start out by saying if your team simply does a colossal amount of damage, then really no other roles need to be filled. Dealing high damage against the behemoth will always be the most important role that you can bring. Players who try to be a tank or a healer must always be optimizing their damage output as well. If you want to be the player who gains the behemoth's enmity, uh, which we might call it the tank, right? You simply need to be able to do damage to his head. This can be tricky for a lot of weapons, and I've found that the light bow gun, the heavy bow gun, and the lance have the easiest time doing it. The gun lance doesn't have the same mobility or the high thrust combo that the lance does, so if you're trying to tank, I think that the lance is better for grabbing that, that aggro, right? Also, Light Bowgun, it lacks his shield, but honestly, you just outspace his moves after he's been aggroed and he becomes enraged, so you don't necessarily need a shield in order to tank him, you just need to be able to shoot him in the head consistently or be able to hit his head consistently. When a player gains the behemoth's enmity, he turns red and his moveset becomes easier to fight in certain ways. In particular, he stops casting tornadoes. We'll get more into that later. As for being a wide range support build, I would pick either light bow gun, sword and shield, or hunting horn for this role. I find that it's generally more important to have a healer in your group than it is to have a tank. Also, if you're playing wide range, be sure that you bring dash juice, more on that later. Okay, we're done talking about the pre-fight. Let's move on to talking about the rest of the flowchart. We're going to speed through this part so that we can move on to getting into those tips. Stage one of the behemoth fight is pretty easy. Just don't miss when you drop those two boulders. That's really important. I wouldn't, you know, just take your time. Also, be sure to have everyone who can deal sever damage start focusing on the behemoth's tail. That might be lances, light bow guns, maybe the insect glaives, except you kind of want to be careful not to mount too early. Uh, what I would do is try to save the mount for stage two, where, in my opinion, the behemoth becomes a bit trickier to fight, so you have the advantage when you can mount him there. You can also decide to use up your sleep ailments in stage one in order to get the falling boulders to deal a whopping 3,500 damage as wake-up attacks. This requires good cooperation from your teammates, though, and honestly, when you're fighting extreme behemoth, I don't necessarily recommend this strategy for that, but it is still pretty useful in regular behemoth. In stage two, the behemoth will from now on use a deadly move called Ecliptic Meteor. I will teach you how to deal with the move in the move set section of the guide. Just know that from now on the fight has gotten a lot more serious and a lot more difficult. At this point, you want to finish cutting off that tail because it affects where the behemoth is going to move to next. He, he, he has two paths he can take for stages three and four. If you fail to break part of his body, he moves down into the lava, which is what you don't want. All right, because the lava is just like 
another thing you have to deal with. And then he eventually goes down to Teostra's Nest, and I don't like fighting him down there. I think he's a bit more difficult. After you deal enough damage, the Behemoth is going to move on to Stage 3. If you cut off his tail, not only do you get to have another carve, but you've nerfed one of his most annoying attacks, and you've caused him to move into the section of the map where you would normally fight Nergigante. Also, his moveset changes in Stage 3, and we'll cover this in more detail later. Finally, after dealing enough damage in Stage 3, the Behemoth is going to move on once again, this time to Stage 4, which is the last stage of the fight. Now, I, I consider this to be the most difficult part of the fight, just because of how crowded it is. He's either going to fight you in Teostra's Nest, if you fail to break his part in Stage 2, or you're going to fight him in Nergigante's Nest. Neither of them are especially fun, they're, they're both very crowded, and he uses a Tornado move, which I'll explain in detail at some point. But what happens is, it's a, an aerial de denial move, and it makes those areas even more crowded, right? So this is really where you want to start pumping out all of your crowd control methods, right? Uh, the Behemoth, is he's kind of weak to crowd control. He's weak to sleep, he's weak to paralysis, he's weak to exhaust, he's weak to KO stun. Uh, I suppose you could add mounting to that list, right? He's weak to all those things, and when it comes to paralysis and sleep, Monsters have an internal health bar where every time you trigger it, the health bar gets bigger. Well, if you hold off on using those ailments to the end, you can trigger them over and over again uh, multiple times before he becomes kind of immune to them, right? So this is where you want to use your crowd control, stage 4. Okay, we did a quick breakdown of the flowchart. Now we need to go into the nitty gritty details of what's going to be making your life easy. We're moving on to section 2 of the guide, where I give you 5 basic tips and 5 advanced tips. Keep in mind, the very important moveset analysis begins in section 3, so if it seems like there's a critical tip missing from this next list, it's because it's moveset related. Tip number 1, put a team together and use microphones. I know, this is an incredibly simple tip, but also maybe annoying and exceptionally true. Teams that use microphones to communicate don't just play better, they have more fun which makes it easier to persevere and keep playing. You also teach each other things. The Behemoth also doesn't scale in difficulty when players join, because he basically already has 4 player health, which is why he's the only monster in the game, where it's probably easier to fight him in a group rather than solo. You can you can try to solo him, I, I did it when he came out. It is pretty difficult. If you're going to try to solo him, probably use cluster bombs like we were talking about earlier. So yeah, but for the most part, getting a team of people together who are communicating all four people, that's going to be your best experience. So take a minute to try to find some players. I've also recently purchased the PC version of the game, so you could consider joining my Discord and asking me or other members uh, who are also playing on the PC to join you. There'll be a link to the Discord in the description of the video. You could almost say tip number one is simply this, don't fight the behemoth with the randoms, but on the other hand, not all randoms are bad. I don't know, maybe that's a little different on the PC because he's coming out for the first time, so you know. The whole community on the PC is going to be trying to learn him for the first time. Over on the consoles now, I feel like he, he, you really you run into more qualified players at this point. Here's a side tip. When the Behemoth uses Ecliptic Meteor for the last time in Stage 4, you might want to run behind a comet and then immediately disconnect from your internet so that your teammates can't cause you to lose the match if they fail to get behind a comet themselves. Now, I don't see anything wrong with this tactic because the fight is already over at this point, and on the PC, it will actually be extra easy to simply disconnect from the internet, because, you know, on the consoles, it's a little more complicated. Tip number two is kind of a longer one. Build an appropriate amount of defense. This is end game content. Anything less than fully augmented good builds are going to be seriously affecting your ability to win. So don't bring your fun builds into this fight. Don't bring average builds into the fight. You got to bring your best builds. Know what a good build is, and then augment all of the pieces of armor on that build so that you've maximized your defense. Let's talk about defensive skills. The Behemoth is one of the most damaging monsters in the game. This is really a case where you're either skilled enough to avoid all of his moves, which you aren't, or you're going to want enough defense that you can't be too shotted. Here's the build priority that I recommend for defensive skills. Simply take Fortitude and then Health Boost. Your other defensive skills that you can choose from should kind of take second priority to damage. So if you have a build that already has all of your damage maxed out, then here's what I would consider next for defense. If you're wearing the Kulv Tiroth Ire, finish stun resistance, right? You already get two free levels of it. The other two skills worth considering are protection 
and even the Tool Specialist skill. With Tool Specialist, the idea is to bring both Rocksteady Mantle and the Temporal Mantle. Then you can go in, you can put the Mantle on, you can go in and attack like crazy while the Mantle's active. After you've run out, you know, your, your Mantles are expired, they're on cooldown, you might as well just chill back for a while and only make safe attacks against the Behemoth while those Mantles are on recharge and then just repeat this cycle. So you're, you're very safe because you're really leveraging the Mantles in this case. Uh, for building Tool Specialist, the Empress Coil Beta is especially good. For building protection, if you need the slots, you can try the Guild Cross Helmet, and of course we already mentioned the Kulv Taroth Ire for stun resistance. We're still not done talking about defense though. This tip could be its own guide. At the canteen, you should consider eating elemental resistance to help deal with the thunder blight. Having 20 or more resistance will make you immune. Uh, I should note, I guess at this point also, the reason you're avoiding thunder blight is because thunder blight allows you to be stunned more easily. Well, if you finished your stun with the Kulv Taroth Ire, right, you completed that skill, you put in a stun resistance decoration, you don't really need to worry about Thunder Blight. But if you didn't, then you do need to worry about Thunder Blight. Either way, eating elemental resistance is going to help you with two of the Behemoth's most common damaging attacks, Meteor and Thunderbolt, I believe it's called Thunderbolt. So you can eat for elemental resistance. When it comes to eating a food skill, you could try to go for Feline Moxie, which allows you to survive being one-shot by everything except Ecliptic Meteor. So players have already tried this. They, they were thinking, I use Feline Moxie, and then it doesn't matter. No, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work with Ecliptic Meteor. It is going to work with his other moves, and he's strong enough that I would still consider it, right? A lot of his moves deal a lot of damage. If you've never learned how to eat for Feline Moxie, I'm doing it on screen right now, so just watch. Notice I check for fresh ingredients. Lots of fresh ingredients increase the odds of that food skill activating. If you want to guarantee that Feline Moxie activates, simply use a meal voucher instead. I do have a guide on farming for meal vouchers as well, I have lots of guides. Maybe a last tip would be that the Lunastra Blaze weapons all come with the Gut skill, which is the same thing as Feline Moxie, but I don't know if I would recommend them though. I don't, I don't necessarily think they're optimal in terms of being a weapon, so that one's up to you. Maybe you know of a particular weapon class that has a niche Blaze, blaze weapon that's like the best version i don't know all the weapon classes i don't have them all memorized but like feline moxie guts will not save you from the ecliptic meteor so this is just a tip basic tip number three learn to dodge ecliptic meteor with the dragoon emote when players first discovered this they thought it was just for fun it's not it's an important skill for the behemoth fight in fact if you were to master this one skill you'd never need to use a comma again. I have a detailed guide on learning to dodge the ecliptic meteor, which is why I don't want to reteach it here. And I did think of just reposting the entire video inside of this guide, but I figured that would be kind of overkill as well. So if you're interested in seeing it, I'll leave a link in the comment section, or you can click here. The Dragoon Emote will save you when you realize that you don't have time to get behind a Comet. It's also possible to safely practice the Dragoon Emote while you're already behind a Comet so that, you know, you get the timing down. Roughly at 7 seconds, that's when you have to open up your radio menu and use that Dragoon Emote. I can also freeze the frames to show you exactly what position the Behemoth was in when I chose to use the emote. And this kind of gives you a visual cue that you can use when you just stare at the Behemoth basically. Just stare at him and when he goes into the right position, that's when you're going to click your joystick to use the emote, right? And that's it, that's the whole guide. Basic tip number four. You can kind of cheese the behemoth in a, in a certain degree by simply mounting him and then not letting go. Essentially, you'll begin the mounting mini game where you ride the monsters back and start stabbing him with your hunter's knife, but instead of stabbing with the knife, you just sit there, moving between his head and his back every time he tries to shake you off. If you run low on stamina and your team still hasn't knocked him over, go ahead and finish the minigame. So this is why earlier in the guide I recommended that healers bring dash juice so that as the healer you can eat the dash juice once someone begins this cheese tactic and it'll essentially fill their stamina bar back up, right? And that means they can stay on the behemoth the whole time without needing to end it. In my opinion, the best place to use this prolonged mount tactic is in stages two and four in order to reduce the number of tornadoes the behemoth will be able to put down in those areas. It would be especially good to use this mount uh, tactic in stage four, where you're most likely going to lose the match, right? Like by then people have probably already died once or twice. So you've made it that far. If you can mount in stage four, that would be terrific. 
Tip number five, flash pods and enmity. Once again, flash pods are king, which is why I made it a requirement to bring three flash pods as well as flash bugs to craft even more flash pods. This is because one of the behemoth's most powerful attacks is to simply put down a whole bunch of tornadoes and the flash pods allow you to interrupt that attack. I'll have more details on that move later down the road, as I've been saying. Flash pods can also be used to cancel enmity if somebody grabbed the behemoth's aggro and doesn't want it. That being said, it's usually the case that whoever grabbed the enmity was actually doing it on purpose, so if your teammate has aggroed the behemoth, don't be rude and don't flash the behemoth at that point. It doesn't make any sense to do this anyways, since the fight is easier when the behemoth has been aggroed because he stops using Charybdis, uh, the tornadoes. If you're a tank trying to grab enmity, but you're having trouble, keep your eye out for when the behemoth drops dragon pods. After firing about six dragon pods anywhere on his body, the behemoth will then aggro to you. Also, if the behemoth grabs you with a pin in stage three, you'll automatically be given enmity in that case as well. Okay, that's the end of tip five. Here's a little bonus tip for you guys. Don't forget to grab the free max potion from the supply box. All right, and now we're going to talk about the five advanced tips that become more specific to the fight. Once again, if you think there's an important piece of advice missing from this list, it's probably because I've put it into the moveset analysis, which comes next. Advanced tip number one, one of the shittiest situations you can get yourself into is to die, get carded, and then die again to Ecliptic Meteor as you run back to the fight. That mistake uses up two of the team's three lives. This is why communication is so important, by the way. Your team needs to give you time to get back into the fight before they push the Behemoth into using Ecliptic Meteor. The other thing I can tell you is that if you're already at the camp and you know it's about time for the Behemoth to start using Ecliptic Meteor, run into the tent to avoid it and wait for your team to tell you to come back out. Now I've read that you're not allowed to go into the tent once the ecliptic meteor has already begun. So you really have to make a decision whether you want to try and run back in time or if you think he must already be so close to that move that you should just wait it out in the tent. Advanced tip number two, let's talk about team healing. A lot of players have mentioned that you should bring life powder for fighting the behemoth. You can also bring blue mushrooms and god buzz bugs to craft additional life powders. I've found that if your team already has a dedicated healer, that the life powders aren't really necessary. In fact, it ends up cluttering your inventory to a certain degree, which is why I prefer to simply bring my own mega potions and max potions. That way, if the healer can't help, you just heal yourself like you normally would. Obviously, I'm assuming you have a skilled healer on your team. If no one is, if no one's playing a healer, life powders might be more appropriate in that case. If you really want to help your team out and you aren't the healer, you could also just bring the Empress Greaves Alpha, since it's going to give you both health boost and two levels of wide range. It's a very efficient piece of armor. That way, when you go to heal yourself like normal, you give your teammates a little help as well. You should also consider bringing the health booster and the affinity booster. If you're like me and play alone most of the time, you sort of forget how useful those can be for your teammates. Now for those of you wondering what kind of support build to play, a Hunting Horn Healer can really make a difference by bringing your team over a threshold for defense and attack. This assumes they brought the, the Hunting Horn Healer brought Deep Vero for an attack up extra large horn buff as well as the defense buff. So what you would do is you would place attack up extra large and the defense extra large and then after you're done setting those buffs down, as a Hunting Horn Healer you would move on to eating an armor skin hard shell power, and an adamant pill, and you can do that for attack as well. Between all of these, as well as your natural horn buffs, you're really starting to notice a big impact on the team's damage and survivability. The bow guns are also able to use demon ammo and armor ammo. They work kind of the same way. However, those tend to be very expensive ammo types, and it's harder to apply them to everyone, because you kind of have to shoot your teammates. Uh, this is especially true if you miss, right? Like if you miss, you've just wasted your ammo. However, there really isn't any other fight more deserving than this one to use those ammo types on, unless you already want to start thinking about saving up for the extreme behemoth. And then we have the sword and shield. The sword and shield doesn't have the luxury of buffing attacks and defense for the team. 
On the other hand, it does have a slightly faster reaction time for eating, since you don't have to sheath your weapon to use items. It's also the only support style weapon that has its own shield. The lance, the gun lance, and the heavy bow gun have shields, but they sheath really slowly, so they're not quite as effective at being a healer, so I don't recommend that. So yeah, it's kind of interesting. Advanced tip number three. For tank players, I want to warn you guys not to become overzealous about building only for defense. In particular, I wouldn't overly worry about building the guard skill. On the other hand, the guard up skill is important for being able to stop all of the behemoth's attacks. However, I feel like the guard skill takes up valuable decoration slots that could go towards something like tool specialist or protection. Just like the dedicated healer, it's important that tanks are able to contribute lots of damage to the fight. I mean, just imagine if the healer and the tank weren't really doing that much damage, you would have a team of four where only two players are dealing significant damage, right? The whole team would be stuck in a behemoth battle that really drags on much longer than it should, and this actually increases the odds that somebody eventually makes a mistake and gets two-shotted. Also, because I know someone is going to ask for this, for the heavy bowguns, you really only need one shield mod. Not really much changes with two shield mods. I think the second one acts kind of like a guard skill, a free guard skill. You don't need that. So take one shield mod and the guard up skill. In fact, if you really wanted my opinion on heavy bowgun defense, I feel that the evade extender skill is more valuable than a shield mod and guard up because you can just roll out of the way of any attack. Advanced tip number four is for the damage dealers. Don't be afraid to swap between different setups based on what stage of the fight you're in. For example, you might start off with the bowgun that uses slice ammo and could put the behemoth to sleep under the falling boulders. This gives you a high damage wake up attack and a way to cut off its tail. Or you might use a hammer in stage two and lure the behemoth toward the large hill in order to use your aerial attacks. Whatever you choose to do, it's generally a good idea to focus on cutting off the behemoth's tail and then focusing on his forearms and his head when you can reach it. Uh, and especially in stage 4, it's important to think about ailments. For mounting the monster, it would be useful if you could hold off on landing a second mount for stage 4. Weapons that can independently cause a mount are the lance, the insect glaive, and the sword and shield. Other weapons will need to find a hill or a ledge if they want to use aerial attacks, and there's, there's actually plenty of those on this map. It's also worth pointing out that the behemoth's chest and unbroken horns will deflect melee attacks. Some weapons are unaffected by this, like shelling on a gun lance or explosive ammo types on a bow gun, and that means you'll be able to spam your attacks in close range, whereas melee weapons will want to aim more carefully. The hunting horn also gets immunity from the deflected attacks, as well as anyone using the mind's eye skill, but either way, with a regular melee build, you're not going to be doing any damage to his chest. Finally, I want to leave a tip to bowgun users that the behemoth is even affected by exhaustion more than you would see with typical endgame monsters, so you might want to consider bringing that exhaust ammo for once, right? Remember, headshots will cause a KO with exhaust ammo. Hammers and hunting horns al also both deal exhaust damage with their regular attacks, so even if you can't hit the behemoth in the head, just keep landing your attacks on his legs and he'll eventually exhaust. A last tip for the hammer players, I found that hitting behemoth in the head was easiest when he was trying to charge Charybdis. Alright, advanced tip number five. So I've made other tip videos back when the behemoth launched on the console and I remember giving out a tip that I thought was more important than the rest. And I intentionally saved it for this video as well. Are you ready? Tip number five is to stop dying. And I think that's still one of the best unironic pieces of advice for fighting the behemoth. If you're having trouble, it's because you're underestimating how fast the behemoth can kill you and you're letting your desire to attack him take precedence over your level of situational awareness. The majority of failed runs against the behemoth will not end in timeouts. They will end with the team wiping. So now that you've heard me say this, you have to let that really sink in and start playing with the goal of staying alive. I always say let the monster attack and then punish the monster when there's an opening. Remember your team only has three lives and you can lose those really fast. Ideally, you would still have all three lives by the end of the third stage, so make that your goal. Good luck. And that's the end of my advanced tips. If you can think of something I didn't, feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section. Of course, you probably want to watch this next part before you do that. We move on to the last and most important part of the guide, an analysis of the behemoth's 10 most deadly attacks. Understanding the behemoth's attacks and how to counter them 
is the key to finding this fight easy and enjoyable. Let's get started. Attack number one and two are going to be put together. It's Comet and the Ecliptic Meteor. Of course, we're going to start with these two moves since they're pretty much responsible for if you can win your match or not, and we have to talk about them together because they kind of interact with each other. The Behemoth uses an attack that you can't get away from, called Ecliptic Meteor. We talked about some tricks for dealing with this attack previously, but the normal way you would avoid this instant one-hit KO attack is to simply run behind one of the comets in the room. You can kind of figure out when the Ecliptic Meteor is getting close, because you'll keep an eye out for when the Behemoth is already using his other attacks, in particular the Comet, about three to four times. At that point, it's time to expect Ecliptic Meteor, and if you're expecting Ecliptic Meteor soon, you better not get yourself into an attack animation that is going to last too long. For example, this is a great example, Wyvern Fire on the Gunlance, right? So if you know it's about time for Ecliptic Meteor, you don't use Wyvern Fire anymore, because you're waiting to have to sheath your weapon and run behind a Comet. Now recognizing when Ecliptic Meteor is going to occur is only one half of the equation. In fact, you might even think of it as the easy half. The other half is all about the Comet. When you deal enough damage to the Behemoth, he summons a Comet on top of one of the players, who then has to move somewhere safe so that the Comet follows him there. You definitely don't want the Comet to land in the center of the map, because when the Behemoth attacks, he actually deals damage to the Comets, and Comets eventually break from this. So the center of the map is most likely going to get the Comet broken. So do you see what I'm saying? The Behemoth is going to take damage, pick a player, He's going to cast or, or summon a comet, and then it's going to kind of follow you around. So you're going to run to a good spot where the comet should land, and that's going to be where you're going to have to run to later when you're trying to avoid the ecliptic meteor. You also don't want to move the comet to the edge of a wall, because players need to be able to stand behind it. So the trick is really to have the comet land nearby, not too close, but not too far away either. I also want to add a helpful note that you should be very sure of which side of the meteor that you should be on, so that the ecliptic meteor will have a kind of a red circle where it's actually going to land, and your job is to be on the side of the comet that avoids that, okay? Uh, and it can be easy to get that confused if you don't look at it carefully. Okay, so that covers comets and the ecliptic meteor. They're not really that complicated, but if you screw it up, you fail the match. Probably my biggest tip with these moves is to always stop and take a moment to scan your surroundings so that you know where all of the comets are as you're fighting the behemoth. Because if he goes into the ecliptic meteor and you don't immediately know in your mind where you should run, that's kind of all you need to do to mess up in order to get killed by that move. Move number three, the behemoth has a tornado attack that we should now properly call by its name Charybdis. Charybdis is an area of denial attack that Behemoth will pump out if you don't control him properly. So this is a pretty big step in winning your fights, because often what happens is you're going to run into one of these, they're like tornadoes during the ecliptic meteor attack, right? You're going to run into one. And then you're going to wipe out because you didn't get behind a comet in time. It's also possible to be walled off from the fight or pinned in a corner by one of these very annoying tornadoes. You're just stuck there. I, I even had a situation where I was just trapped between two tornadoes, uh, Charybdis or whatever, whatever you want to call it. It would pick me up, throw me out into the other tornado, and then that tornado would pick me up and throw me back into the first one. Really bad. So there are three methods for controlling this attack. The first trick is to simply place the attack against the wall. Uh, that's because similar to the Comet, Behemoth has to cast Charybdis on one player, and he takes some time doing this. So if he's chosen you, stop chasing him, stop attacking him in the middle of the map, and instead go run off to a wall. That way when Charybdis lands, it lands out of the way. The second method is to interrupt Charybdis with your flash pod, which we already talked about. Charybdis has a bit of a windup, so you typically have enough time to sheath your weapon and flash the Behemoth, which will interrupt the cast. There's no limit to how many flash pods you can use for this as well, so there's no reason why you couldn't stop every single Charybdis from landing. And the third strategy is to simply gain the Behemoth's enmity, right? Aggro him. And at that point, he will stop using his magical casting attacks. Charybdis does eventually go away on its own with enough time, right? Those tornadoes, they will eventually die off. So if a player accidentally causes all of your comets to be blocked by a poorly placed tornado, you can wait until it ends before dealing enough damage to trigger Ecliptic Meteor, right? Because you, you need to get behind those comets. 
Move number four, there's the regular Meteor. Meteor is just a straight up damaging ability that the Behemoth will cast very commonly. Depending on which stage of the fight you're in, it seems like he either ta targets one player or all of the players. It does a fair amount of damage and he uses it so often that you need to be constantly vigilant to respond in time with either a dodge or a guard. A red glow will show up under your feet to let you know that you've been targeted by Meteor. Move number five, Thunderbolt. Similar to Meteor, Thunderbolt is just a straight damaging attack. It starts off with the pretty much impossible to dodge burst of static in a large area around him, and this will immediately leave you Thunderblighted. Remember we talked about that Thunderblight resistance. Then the attack will turn into several bolts of lightning that are kind of spread out. I believe they follow the player, but as long as you keep moving, uh, they will cast behind where you were. You see what I'm saying? They'll lock on, but if you're moving, they're going to miss you. Move number six. In stage three, the behemoth uses a new attack is a pin that also applies bleed. After the animation for this move ends, he's also going to aggro onto you with his enmity. So you get grabbed and then you get his aggro. This doesn't necessarily help you in stage three because the behemoth doesn't even use Charybdis. So it's like you don't actually need his aggro in that stage. In order to dodge this pin, you have to be constantly ready to strafe and roll out of the way of it. Uh, he, you'll actually see his, his horns go down and he does, he does kind of a headbutt. If you're the healer and you see someone getting pinned in stage 3, you should start off with the heal move to make sure that they can't die, and then follow up with an Astera Jerky to remove the bleed ailment. If you're playing solo and you get pinned, this can be really deadly. Well, it's a high pressure moment anyways, because what's going on? You've got the bleed status, but he's also aggroed to you at the same time, which means he's going to chase you down and you're going to have to keep moving until you can eat an Astera Jerky. So it's a pretty dangerous situation to be in, you have to be real careful. Move number seven. The behemoth has an attack I'm going to call eruptions. The eruptions occur right in front of him as he whips his head back. It kind of covers like both front parts of his arms and his head. You can see where the move is going to have a hitbox because the ground glows a reddish color before activating. This is simply a high damage move with a large hitbox that you don't get a warning for other than the windup itself. You can guard this move or do your best to roll out of the range of the attack. It has a very short windup, unfortunately, so it's hard to tell when it's going to come out, and it's very similar to an attack Behemoth uses in Stage 3, where he throws his fist down to send out the eruptions in a line in front of him. He also likes to use this version of eruptions when he's become enraged through enmity. Dangerous move number 8 is the Tail Whip. Behemoth's version of a Tail Whip involves him swiping in a full 360 degree circle. Before you cut his tail off, this move has a ton of range and does so much damage. It's very hard to avoid, especially for players who can't simply guard, which is just another reason why cutting his tail off should be a priority. If you're playing a melee build, the safest place from this attack is either far away from his body or directly underneath it. Tail Whip is surprisingly dangerous because of how little time you get to react and how much reach and damage it has. Dangerous move number 9, Body Slam. With Body Slam, the Behemoth stands up on his hind legs for a few extended moments and then comes crashing down for very high damage. This move is ripped right off of Valhazak and you don't want to be underneath it when it lands. It can be surprisingly hard to get away from just because of how large the Behemoth is and players with shields will need the guard up skill in order to be able to guard this attack. Finally, the last dangerous attack the Behemoth uses a lot is his Shoulder Charge which comes from the Nergigante moveset. It's exactly what the name suggests. The Behemoth pulls his shoulder against the ground and charges forward. It has so much range that he can basically cross the map. Wherever, whatever map section you're in, he, he'll mostly cross it. Your best bet for avoiding it is to detect the move early and roll to the side of the move so that he passes by. You could alternatively guard it. All right, well, that's all 10 moves. We're gonna go ahead and give an honorable mention to his very fast claw swipe, it's not going to kill you, but it interrupts you all the time, as well as his jump attack, which allows him to move around quickly. This is the end of the guide. Once again, I'll remind you to consider making it easier for others to find by liking and sharing it. That's everything I wanted to say. I want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.